try something, uh, why not embrace change? That is what the company is all about. So we switched it uh, to YouTube and we are going to do this together. First and foremost, find that chat box for me. Oh, and I see somebody in the chat box. Oh, I appreciate you, Resin for Reds. I don't know what that name means, but I like it. And it looks like you're representing uh, Sarasota. We have Hope Cross with us representing Arcadia. And by the way, I have a co-host with me uh, today that I'm very excited to have. Tina, say hi to the, say Hello. hi to the world. Hi world. <laughs> hi to the world. The vast, the vast world. So here's what we're going to do. Um, it's going to be a little different today than my traditional trainings. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to, uh, I'm going to talk with Tina. We're going to share personal experiences. And the beauty about moving to this type of platform is after we're done, you get to go back and and check on some of the items that we discussed that you you found interesting or you found helpful. You can review it uh, at a time that's convenient uh, for you. But first, uh, one more time, I want to thank everybody for joining us on this this type of platform. Everyone that subscribed, it means a lot. Uh, the Speak for MC YouTube channel started with one subscriber, that was me, and then it was two subscribers, and that was my mom, and now we're at, uh, I believe, 679. It is small steps, but you are taking those steps with me, and being here today means a lot. But let's get down to business. Motivational interviewing inspired tools for toddlers and young people. So I did this training a couple of months ago, and we had over about 120 registered, and I was unsure, you know, how it would go. Will some of these tools and these techniques translate to, you know, the younger population? Tina, I will tell you the feedback, overwhelming. We had 85% said it exceeded their expectations. We had one person say they didn't like it, but that's okay. You know, that, that, that happens. Uh, but some of the most uh, common feedback when we did our last training was, what about part two? What about part two? So this is why we are here. We are here for part two. So let's get this thing started. For those that do not know me, I'm going to go ahead and show you. Look at that guy on that screen. That is me as a case manager. That was me when I believed I was going to save the world all by myself. Tina, when you first got <laughs> into this field, did you, you, did you think you were going to save the world all by yourself? Oh, I was going to save everyone and anything. Yeah, yeah. That, that's why we do it, right? You don't get into this field because of the money uh, or, or the fame or the fortune or the 679 YouTube subscribers. No, you don't do that. <laughs> you, you do it to, to make a difference. And my journey towards making a difference uh, started as a group home worker in South St. Pete. That was probably one of the more challenging jobs that I've ever had. Uh, that was a co-ed group home, girls on one side, uh, boys on the other, and just you in, in in that desk in the middle. Tina, you ever do the group home work? Oh group yes, home? I worked with teens that were homeless in Tampa. Yep. Yeah, so you so you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, you learn a lot. You learn a lot. Um, you learn about behavior, about change, about patience, which is something we're going to discuss today. Then I was a director of a YMCA, case manager for at-risk youth. Uh, program manager uh, for young people on probation, an area manager for a department of labor program that served adults, and then a transition director where we served 145 of the most at-risk young people in the state of Florida every single uh, day. It was probably one of the most rewarding uh, experiences I've had uh, from a professional perspective. And then now, now Speak for MC. In the comments, do we know what Speak for MC uh, stands for? Uh, maybe, maybe not. No, uh, Tina, help me out. Oh, don't do it to me, Tina. Speak yes. for yes. motivational change. There it is. Right? Yay! <laughs> Give Tina a round of applause. Speak for MC is speak for motivational change. So let's look at what the mission is, the vision of that is. Uh, speak for MC believes that any child, organization, or community can grow. Um, everything I do is inspired by collaboration. Uh, optimism and empathy. Um, optimism for me, sometimes when I, I tell people I'm an optimistic person, they're like, oh, that must mean that you're happy all the time and you think everything's good all the time. And you're just positive all the time. That, that's not to me what optimism is. Optimism is when things are hard, uh, when things are tough, when you're going through it, do you still maintain a solution focused mindset? Do you still keep working 
towards a positive resolution? Are you optimistic that there is a solution at hand? And I believe the only problems that don't get solved are because the people who can solve them stop looking for them. So let's not let's not stop. Let's keep pushing forward towards positive change. And everything is about disrupting the status quo. You know, sometimes, especially in a workplace, you'll hear those those comments. It is what it is. What do you want me to do about it? Even with parents, sometimes I think Tina, they'll say, well, what do you want me to do? There's nothing I could have did. It is what it is. Yeah. And what, what we're really trying to do is, yes, there are things that are out of your control, but what you can always control is how you respond to situations and, and continually trying to be the person or be the parent that you want to be and making decisions that, that align with that. So that's my little uh, elevator pitch, Tina. Can I pass it to you and tell us who, who you are, yep. uh, what you do, all that good stuff? Absolutely. My name is Tina Miller, and I've worked over 25 years in social work, education, and juvenile justice. And I've also been a licensed therapeutic foster care parent and have worked with ages 2 to 18. Now, I actually consider them opportunity youth. I don't like to use the at-risk term uh, because I think these are youth that have opportunities, and we're actually creating those opportunities with these youth. And um, I also have actually uh, been certified in ABA as well as TBRI, which is Trust-Based Relational Interventions. And I've been trained by the one and only Curtis on motivational interviewing. <laughs> and uh, also, um, I started my own nonprofit. I used to work for um, the Department of Juvenile Justice. I resigned from that position. I started a nonprofit for the Recovery Schools of Tampa Bay, which I've now opened to nonprofit private schools for ages 14 to 19 year olds that struggle with addictions and mental illness. Mm. I love it. Thank you, Tina. And, and we're really excited to have Tina's uh, guidance today, not only as a professional who's working to inspire and change, but also as, as a mom, right? T tell us a little bit about um, your, your role as a mom, what that looks like. What's, give us a little personal window into it. Absolutely. Tina. So my foster son is 27 years old now, and he's very successful and doing an incredible uh, work in this world. And I have a birth son uh, who is 18 years old now, Victor. And he's just an amazing person. I, I love when they get older and you're like, man, you're like the best person ever. You know, I know he's my son. I'm a little biased, but he is <laughs> such an incredible, creative individual. And so uh, I've always loved working with children. So awesome. Appreciate that. And my moderator, uh, Hope, just gave me a little text that some people cannot respond uh, to the chat. So in order to respond in the chat and engage with us today, you do have to hit the subscribe button. Uh, we have that in there so the chat doesn't get flooded with uh, other stuff. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe people who don't like the Buccaneers. We don't want all of that in there. So if you do want to participate in the chat, uh, just hit that subscribe button, and then you'll have the ability to give your input, your thoughts, all of that good stuff. And I see a motto is in the in the chat as well. How you're doing? Thank you for joining us. Also representing uh, Sarasota. So definitely hit that subscribe button, and then participate in the chat so we can communicate together. So let's talk about my favorite quote. This quote I introduce at every single training. And uh, Tina, I'm actually going to get your opinion on this here in a second after I read this quote, what comes to mind. Uh, but the quote is, if you give a plant soil, water, and sunshine, it will grow upwards towards the light. If you give a plant soil, water, and sunshine, it will grow upwards towards the light. I'm going to ask Tina here in a second what her thoughts are when she hears that quote. But as you're reading it or you're hearing it, tell me in the comments uh, what you think that quote means. How do you think that quote um, has to do with change? Maybe how does that quote have to do with being a parent? Give me your thoughts in the comment section so we can kind of bounce those ideas off each other. But let me go to Tina first. Uh, Tina, when you hear, if you give a plant soil, water, and sunshine, it will grow upwards towards the light. What, what comes to mind there? What comes to mind when I hear that quote is that we just plant seeds. And sometimes we don't see the seeds flourish. We don't see them bloom. And sometimes the seeds may fall on concrete <laughs> and you think there's no way the seeds ever gonna grow. But I'm telling you, over consistency and everything that this man's going to tell you today, you're going to be able to see that seed bloom, and it's going to be unbelievable and a harvest that's going to 
just bloom for years and years to come. I love that. I love that. And that's essentially what we're doing in our field, right? Anyone who has yeah. a background um, in any type of social uh, services, you're planting seeds and you're trying to encourage uh, positive growth. And the reason for that, and Tina, can you, and you would know, can you make someone change? Absolutely not. You cannot, you cannot make someone change. If you could, the, the world would be a very different place, right? Like if you could just press a button or just say a magic, uh, use a magic technique and they would, the thoughts or attitudes and beliefs would be different, then the world would be a, a different place. But that's not how it works. So then the question is, if you can't make someone change, then whose responsibility is it to change? Tina, whose responsibility is it to change, you think? It is that individual's responsibility. Yeah. If, if it's their change, uh, it's their change. So I say all that to say is in this conversation, in this workshop we're going to have together, we're going to give some tips and tools that represent the soil, water, and sunshine as a parent. But we're not giving these tools to say, if you do the soil, water, and sunshine, then you'll always get the response you want. Not how it works. The person who has the final say on the behavior and on the choice is the person whose behavior and choice it is. So what I want to challenge you to do is when you leave here and after you watch this video, is not judge yourself as a parent by how often necessarily you get it, you got the outcome you wanted, but judge yourself as a parent by how committed were you to making the decisions that align with the type of parent you want to be? How committed are you to the soil, the water, and the sunshine? And then more often than not, the child will grow in response to that light. They will grow in response to that soil, water, sunshine, but it's not a guarantee in every, every situation. So I say all that to say, Tina, I mean, parents, give yourself a break. You know, it's, me, I, I've only been a parent for a year and a half, uh, two years or so, and I thought I knew, Tina, um, what it meant to be a parent. <laughs> I, I did not know until I had a little one in the house. In fact, I had no idea. Uh, so, so some days are really hard. Some days are tough. But again, are you making decisions that align with the person you ultimately want to be, with the parent you want to be? How committed are you to the soil, the water, and the sunshine? So let's talk about um, what is one element uh, of growth and what I believe is it can be the foundation of your interactions uh, with your child. And it is called motivational interviewing. I was trained as a motivational interviewing trainer, I think 11 12 years ago by the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice. And I, my mind was, was blown. I was like, wait a minute, this, this makes so much sense. You know, this is how you draw out of people uh, their intrinsic motivation to work towards, work towards change. So then I began using motivational interviewing as a case manager in my personal life. When I uh, moved up into leadership and supervisory roles, it worked everywhere. And what is, why does it work? Well, first, motivational interviewing is an evidence-based approach. There are more than a thousand controlled trials that demonstrates MI's effectiveness. And why was it effective? It's because they found that when someone interacts with an empathetic, non-judgmental listener, they are going to be less defensive and less anxious. And Tina, if you're less defensive and you're not anxious, guess what you're more likely to have? An open mind. Open. Yes, so if, you, if you're more likely to have an open mind, then that means you're gonna be more open to new perspectives. You're gonna be more open to uh, direction or advice or feedback. But Tina, if I'm defensive, if I'm anxious, if I'm frustrated. Wall. Yeah, and, and then what type of mind are we probably gonna have Closed. there? We're gonna, ha we're gonna have a closed mind. So what you're doing constantly is trying to reduce that anxiety, reduce that defensiveness, uh, interact with someone where they don't feel uh, judged. So it inspires them to kind of see more clearly, see the, the full picture, and then be more likely to take your guidance and your feedback and your advice as a parent. And that's what you're trying to do. I think every parent, for the most part, Tina, wants to pass on guidance and advice and, and feedback. Would you agree? Absolutely. Like that's, that's one of the main parts of being a parent, right? So if, if your goal is to do that, then the premise is do it in a way where it's more likely to be received. And motivational interviewing gives you a really good foundation on, on how to do that. Something else I want to share with you, I'm really proud of. My last training that I did 
Um, we, we phrase it as like an EA, EAP plan for parenting. But uh, I was so inspired by the audience in that training and uh, the topics that we are discussing. I contacted Hope and Hope is in, Hope is in the, the chat who wrote her own book. And if you have not, um, if you have not looked into Hope Cross's book, Hope, if you could put that in the chat box so people could find it. Um, it is incredible, her story, her journey, and the change she is attempting to inspire as well. But Hope inspired me to write my own book. And what you're looking at right now is my book coming out in May. It is called Cape Conversations, Evidence-Based -based Techniques uh, to Guide Conversations with Your Children. And what we're going to do in this training is talk about two parts of the cape. We're going to go through the C, we're going to go through the A, and then Tina, if we have time, maybe we'll kick around some ideas on the, on the P and the E. So let's talk about what, what, these, uh, what the CAPE stands for. It is choosing, avoiding, uh, practicing, and expressing. So we want to choose choices. We want to avoid arguments. Maybe. We, do we want to... <laughs> Tina? <laughs> Try to. We try to avoid arguments. You know, I, I do appreciate the irony of uh, me talking about avoiding arguments on YouTube. <laughs> the, the, perhaps I, I digress. Well, avoiding arguments with with uh, with our children, practicing patience, which is a big one, and then obviously expressing empathy. Empathy is the foundation of of everything. If we don't have that, everything else is probably going to come uh, crumbling crumbling down. So let's let's get into it here. Now, if you have not yet, let me show you this on my screen here. Where is it? Oh, technology. Okay. If you see it on your screen, um, that is the Cape handout that I created for everybody attending this. If you have not downloaded uh, the handout to follow along, go ahead to speakformc.com. And if you go to the event cave uh, page, you can download it as a PDF and kind of work with us in real time. Again, because you don't have the ability on YouTube to go off mute or jump into the conversation, I want to try to make this as interacting with, with each other as possible. So if you do not have that handout, go download that, that real quick. And if you already downloaded it, have that in front of you so we can, we can follow along. If you look at that handout, um, first there's the tips on how to avoid. I did not put arguments because I wanted to keep that a secret, a, a surprise, but now you know. But that is for your tips on how to avoid arguments. So as we're talking about that, you can put your tips down there. The other thing I'm going to have you do in a moment is write your top three values that represent you as a parent because that's going to help us guide our conversation as, as well. And then I put write your P's on here. And what those P's are is that patience. What are some strategies we can have to practice patience in the most uh, difficult times? And then there's some other Easter eggs on that, on that guide that you can see. I put little things that give us hints on what we're going to be talking about, but use that as a way to guide our conversation. And with that being said, let's talk about values. I'm going to give you a, a minute to identify your three values uh, that you believe represent you as a parent. So what are your non-negotiables as a parent? Uh, the, the three values that when you're um, raising your children, when you're interacting with your children that are most important that you stay true to, what are those? So um, pick your three. Let us know in the comments what your three are so I can kind of get a feel of, of what the group. And let's go to Tina. Tina, you think we can get one or two or three uh, values from you. What are what are some values that represent you as a parent? Absolutely. Kind of your non-negotiables, and I believe I, I gave you a list on there too. Oh, I, 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 I have a, I have a I have a whole list. You already. have a whole list. Okay. Uh, talk, <laughs> that I've been thinking about. Yeah. Um, well, number one, you know, I don't want my child to murder anyone, um, but also, you know, I want um, I want them to be healthy, and I want to I want. I want to focus more on their efforts than their grades. I think this is a huge one when it comes to parenting, especially grade school and junior, you know, middle school and high school students. 
and focus more on their efforts and not their grades. Mm -hmm. And then um, also, I think consistency is the key. So yeah. really um, valuing that communi communication with one another. Yeah, I, I like that consistency. For me, um, obviously, empathy is, is a big one. I, I believe, like, kind of like if, if you're building a house, um, you could put all this money into the pool. You could put all your money into your lawn. When the neighbors walk by, they could be like, wow, look at that house. But if you did not invest a lot into your foundation, when a storm comes, um, everything's going to come down. And, and when, I, when I talk about interacting with young people, I think the foundation is empathy. Uh, you could have all the incentives you want. You can have the best services in the world. But if you don't have a foundation rooted in empathy, when adversity hits and team adversity is going to hit, um that's what that's what happens and let's give real quick a shout out i've been trying to keep this gentleman out of the training and it has not been working that is mr uh mr carl his values are pet getting petted uh i don't Licky. know petted is a word yeah uh snacks and attention so that's his values now carl will you please go back in your bed carl back in go your back bed. go back all right and his other value is not listening uh so let's <laughs> Let's look at the chat box for a second. We have uh, honesty, <laughs> um, leading by example, integrity, uh, love, understanding, structure. Uh, in our chat, we have integrity, uh, truth. I think these are all incredible values. Integrity is, I think, maybe one of the most important ones uh, to Tina. Uh, who are you when nobody's watching? Uh, that's you in your purest form, mm -hmm. right? When there's an audience, that's a different version, but when it's just you and it's time to make the hard decisions, then who, who are you, right? And I believe that's where you really see um, the level of integrity each, each person has. And then the other value that I definitely believe is part of the foundation is uh, em empowerment, uh, collaboration, um, embracing uh, the child's independence, their autonomy. I think that goes a long way into their development, which leads us to the very first part of CAPE, which is C, choosing choices. Uh, Tina, yeah. choices. Let's talk about um, you as a parent. What role did providing choice have, do you believe, on, on, huge, on your effect on your child? Huge, huge role. I remember when my son was you know, a, little, a little guy, and I would always give him choices, but it was the outcomes that I wanted, okay? So I would be like, you know, it's time to sit down and eat. Would you like to sit on the beanbag chair or would you like to sit <laughs> in your height chair? You know, so I'd always give him the choices of what I want him to do, but he didn't know that. So he would, you know, he would be all excited. And, you know, uh, I remember he was really into uh, this cartoon character. And so he would always choose to sit in that chair. It was this big red chair. And that was, you know, his choice. And then he would actually comply. And so I think that's important with our children to give them the choices of the outcomes that we want. And then they feel empowered and they feel like that, you know, oh, I'm a big, I'm a big boy. I made a choice. You know, I made a decision on my own. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of choices, if you um, choose to go in the comments, uh, we first need you to choose to hit the subscribe button. So the only way you can participate in the chat, just a reminder, because I, I got a couple messages that people can't uh, get in the chat. You got to first hit that, hit that subscribe button. Yeah, choice, choice is everything. So let's talk about the psychology of, of choice for, for a moment. Um, providing options enhances the perception of control. So why is it important that your child feels they have control? Well, because ultimately, as we talked about, it is the person's responsibility to change whose change it is. So if you want them to feel that they have an impact on their growth, on their change, on the direction they're going, you have to encourage their autonomy in having, having those uh, choices. Having control also, I believe, uh, decreases anxiety. Um, if you're just being dictated to, being made to do something, um, you're being told to do something that you don't think is right, but you're being forced to do it, that can definitely increase anxiety with your child, some defensiveness, and maybe they might do it, but they're um, looking for their chance to kind of rebel a little bit. And that's another important note, Tina, and tell me if you, if you agree or disagree on this, but when we are not providing choice, 
we are more requesting a different C word and what that other C word is compliance. Um, and if you're making someone comply, if you're making a child comply, then what happens is they're only going to comply until that consequence that you're, you're using to make them comply is no longer there, right? So parents, in other words, you're making children do a certain thing. What happens when you're not there to observe if they're doing that behavior? If the consequence, perceived consequence is gone, they're going to do, go do what they want to do. The other thing is compliance might work if you're like bribing them, right? I'll give you X if, if you do what, what I'm asking you to do. But the problem with that type of compliance as well is what happens when the thing you're using to bribe, the carrot, is no longer as important to the, to the child. <laughs> now I'm going to go back to the behavior that I, I want. Now, compliance sometimes is required uh, like if the child's in danger. Um, the example I like to use is like if, 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 you're, if your kid is running into the street, you're not going to be like, hey, you know, I'll give you some choices here. <laughs> You can get out of the street, you can stay and see what happens, or you, you know, you're gonna be like compliance, get out of there, mm -hmm. right? But if the idea then is to prevent future occurrences running into the street, is is embracing that that autonomy. And then having choice encourages empowerment, uh, confidence, a feeling that they can be successful and, and accomplish things. And empowerment is, I think, really important with children. When you hear empowerment, uh, being a parent that empowers their children, what kind of comes to mind uh, there, Tina? I think empowerment is really taking, like you said, that control. And so what's so interesting about our brain is when we, I can really geek out on this, so I'll try not to, but uh, I love neurological health and biological health and all of that. But um, when we look at the brain and when you give someone a choice, you use the right right side of the brain and I call it right brain. Uh, and um, actually they have to be creative to come up with the choice and the decision in that. And so what that actually does is, you know, there's pleasure centers in that in your brain and then there's the pain center. And so if you actually have, of that ability to make a choice by feeling empowered it's using that right side of the brain and so you're not tapping into that um, attitude or that you know I'll show you or hurt me type of stuff that a lot of teenagers might get into but little ones do as well and so it, it kind of breaks down that whole argumentative um, but the empowering part is just really important I think with every individual uh, even as staff, as adults, we want to feel empowered that we that someone trusts us. Yeah, and that's what it's based on. Absolutely, and you, you made a good point too. Uh, our brain rewards us um, um, when we do something positive. So if we accomplish something or we succeed in something, our brain rewards and says, "Hey, that felt good." So go seek out more of that. Right, which leads to that positive growth. Now our brain can also reward us for making bad decisions if a pleasurable feeling happened. So what you want to do is enforce the positive uh, feelings that your child gets from making a good decision, from making a choice that had a positive outcome. You want to empower them that that was you. That wasn't just because you were following mommy and daddy. You you did that, and the brain will reward them uh, for that. Empowerment is the process of becoming stronger, more confident, um, especially as it relates to controlling one's life. Um, that someone feeling that the decisions they make have an impact on where they go and what happens to them is incredibly important, as opposed to like an external locus of control. I am only here because of these things that happen to me. Um, I am where I am because uh, that's just how the cards were dealt and there was nothing I can do about it. That type of mindset really pushes the child into being a just a observer of their own journey. You want them to be an active participant who feels they can positively uh, affect it. And then the other part of empowerment that I think is really interesting is true empowerment. Uh, Tina, tell me what comes to mind when I say this, but uh, true empowerment is when you believe you're the expert in a situation, but you treat someone else like they're the expert. In, in the situation. So in other words, can you suspend your, oh, I know what is the right decision. I've done this a million times to then treat that person like they are the, the expert. And I think this resonates with parents because 
we, we probably do feel like we're the expert in a lot of things, right? We already lived this thing <laughs> called life, no? <laughs> no. As a, a parent of a team. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, right? So the idea is we live this thing already, so we want to, hey, I know what you should do, I know what you should do, but can we suspend that to treat them like the expert? Because in the reality, they are because they have direct access to what? What do they have direct access to that you don't? To changing themselves. <laughs> yes. And what up here? Their brain. Their brain. Their <laughs> they have, anytime you're interacting with people and you're trying to inspire, inspire positive change, and that's why a motivational interviewing is so beautiful, is that they have direct access to their brain, which means they have direct access to their thoughts their ideas, their experiences, their intrinsic motivations, they have closer access to that than you do. So if you're treating them like you're the expert when they have the thing that makes them the expert, you know, we're kind of working, we're working backwards. So um, even though you are an expert as a parent, and I'm sure there are many situations where you believe you know what direction needs to go, try to find um, room there to empower them in what they think as, as well. And that can go a long way in making a stronger, uh, more confident, uh, child. And then the other thing is when you empower children, they become better problem solvers. Um, they become more self-reliant, which I'm assuming every parent wants, at least to a certain ex extent, right? Um, and then they become more resilient. They're more likely to bounce back from uh, adverse situations. And spoiler alert, Tina, I don't know if you know this, but adversity is, is going to come eventually, right? Like, is that, <laughs> oh, absolutely. Is that happens, right? Yes. You know, yes. eventually bad things are going to happen. Uh, but when you have an empowered child, they're going to be more resilient when those things happen because they believe, you know what, I can make choices that can pull myself out of this situation that can lead to a positive outcome. And then they become better decision makers, more of a critical thinker, which is which is important as well. The majority of the decisions we do make are fueled by an emotional response. But um, if you can take a step back sometimes from how you're feeling, I feel like I'm right to get to a place of really saying, Hey, what are the options here? Seeking someone um, that has an objective feedback, uh, looking into additional information that might help me make more of a uh, effective decision. You, you're 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 creating decision makers with your children when you when you empower uh, empower them. So here's what um, we're gonna do, and then go ahead in the chat box for me too. Tell me how you empower your children. Um, what are some ways you promote their autonomy? I'm interested to hear uh, what our viewers think as well. But now we're going to do something really uh, interesting, Tina. <laughs> you, did you ever want to be in Hollywood? I always, yes. You did? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is perfect then. Um, so what we're going to do is Tina and myself are going to act out this intense scene and then get your get your <laughs> get your thoughts on this. So I'm gonna put the script on the screen as, as well, so you can read along. Uh, do not judge us. So let's let's do this. When I say uh, action, Tina, would you like to be the child or the parent? I would love to be the child. Oh boy, are right, you were too excited about that, <laughs> uh, Tina? All right, action. He pushed me down. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, sweetie. That. That sounds like it hurt. <laughs> yeah. What do you What do you want to do? <laughs> okay. We, we we can leave if you want. No. Okay. Well, you can go back in the game and show them who's boss. <laughs> it's your choice, sweetie. Uh, I'll do whichever you pick. We can actually just sit here for a little longer, just just you and me. Uh, we could go home now, or you can go back in the game. And, and try to win. Go back in the game and kick some butt. See, good job, Tina. Let me know in, in the uh, in the comments if if Tina is is ready for Hollywood. If that was everything that you that you expected. I'm gonna when I watch this back, I feel like I'm gonna have some words for my my ability there. But let's talk about it, uh, Tina. Let me put the script back on the scene, uh, and then tell me in the chat box a, a, as well. What are your initial thoughts on this interaction? Um, Tina, what are you seeing here as it relates to choices, the C and K? Kind of give me your thoughts on, on this. So first, of, first and foremost, I love the validation of that must have hurt. Mm. That is, that to me was like super touching because I think oftentimes as adults and parents, 
we just want to fix or we want to change their feeling, yeah. especially if it's a feeling of that they're sad and crying. So just to validate, you know, that must have hurt. Yeah. And let's pause there for a second because I think that's that's such a, a great point. What is that statement uh, doing, Tina? What what do we what do we what do we add into our foundation of interaction right away with that? Empathy. Statement? Empathy right off the bat. Because to your point, if we take that statement out, right, and it, so the child says he pushed me down, and then right away you go, well, what do you want to do about it? You have completely left out empathy, compassion, connecting with that child on an emotional level. And to your point, Tina, you went straight into problem solving, which sometimes as a parent, that's what that's what we want to do. But we can't solve a problem until we connect with someone emotionally. What, what else What else do you, do you think there from the interaction? And then point? I think the open-ended question of what do you want to do? Yep. Yep. What, what do you what do you think, Tina, is the um, the goal of that type of question or an open ended question in, in that scenario? I think it's actually, you know, determining where that child is at. So emotionally, you know, maybe, maybe they're hungry, maybe they're tired, maybe, you know, it's like just checking in with them to see exactly what it is that they want to do emotionally and going from there. Absolutely. So the, the, the C and K right away is about choices, right? So right off the bat, we're saying here, here's adversity. Here's um, a situation that was tough on you, like we talked about, will come. But right away, we're trying to empower them and saying, but you have a say in how this, how this thing turns out. As opposed to saying, well, do you want to go home? Well, did, you need to get right back in there. Well, you need to go tell them that you're... What do you, what do you want to do right away creating some uh, autonomy in that interaction? What, what, what else are you thinking in there, Tina? Well, I love the, you know, we can leave if you want. Hmm. Why, what, st what stood out to you about that? Why, why, do you, why do you think that was a positive approach? Because it's a choice hmm. and it's not assuming that that's what the child wants. Is yeah. They just want to leave. Yeah. And, and the other thing, what I like about that is if you notice, it's not a, another question. Mm -hmm. It's not do you want to leave right off the bat. Because the other thing we want to be cognizant of, especially when anxiety is heightened or defensiveness is heightened, in this situation, the child is defensive. They're anxious, right? If you're firing off question, 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 all that's going to do is raise the defensiveness and raise the anxiety. So what we kind of want to do is put like neutral statements with a period so they don't appear as questions. It's just say, you know, we can leave. You're just putting that out there and giving them the opportunity to to respond. Uh, what, what else do you think, Tina? And I like that you're giving them an option. You know, you can go back in the game, but then you also are adding some humor or you can show them who's boss. You know, yeah. I think that's a, a lot of fun. You know, that's one of the things I think as parents, sometimes we're in that parent role so often that we forget about like we have a sense of humor and that yeah. we can actually have fun with our kids. Absolutely. And that's a good catch there, too, Tina, because um, that line is is occurring based off of previous information that I know about the child. So in other words, in this situation, this child is competitive and, and likes to win and likes to get out there and, and, and push herself. So saying, hey, you can show them who's boss, that taps into intrinsically what motivates mm -hmm. her, right? So that's just, I'm not just saying that out of nowhere. It's, it's knowing again with your child, what underneath the surface, what drives them, what motivates them, what gets them excited. And if you notice there's an exclamation point because it's a happy thing. It's not show them who's boss then. It's not one of those like, go do it. I say, you can show them who's boss, we got this. It's that positive trying to reduce that defensiveness and that anxiety. And then how, how did that interaction end there, Tina? What are your thoughts on how that thing was wrapped up? Oh, I think that once again, you know, you're validating uh, the child and, um, and then you're, you know, telling them that, you know, hey, whatever you choose, I'm going to back you. I got your back. I like it. And speaking of child, uh, the other one has made an appearance. Uh, that's Mr. Watts. If you've been to any of my trainings, you know he is always around. So uh, try not to let him let him uh, distract you. He also can't hear, so we got to give him one of these to get away. All right, now he's just giving Tina love. Hey, this is this is a live stream, people. So I mean, we, I don't know what you want me to do. Sometimes the audience just jumps into the training, and there's nothing we can do about it. 
So there, there is, there is. Oh, he's talking. The wasp. All right. So at the end, we're we're circling back. It's almost like a summary. You notice? It's all right. Let's recap what all of our options are. Let's recap how we're feeling. It's your choice, sweetie. And you notice, um, I'm constantly trying to connect emotionally as well. There's a saying that you can't you can't rationalize with an emotional response. You can only connect with it emotionally. So you want to consistently do that in your interactions. And then you give the choices again. Hey, we could just sit here and just hang out for a bit. Um, we can leave if we need to, or you can go back in that game and try to win, which again is tapping back into what I know intrinsically motivates the child. And in that situation, she ran right back in the game. All tears gone, all crying, there was no other, ran right back into the game. But again, if we just went from, oh, you're hurt, we'll get back in there or we're going home, I, I don't think that that type of empowerment would have been would have would have been the same. All right, let's. I, I think I have uh, another one. Let's see what we got here. And, and give me your uh, look. Thank you, Hope. Yes, Watts is uh, Watts is in the building. All right, let's try. Yep. And now he's digging. So for, I can't get the camera over there. So now essentially what he's doing is because he did not get enough pets from Tina, he is uh, tearing up his bed and just going at it so you know uh hashtag live stream if you if you don't know watts he has his own facebook account but i digress all right uh let's let's do one more uh tina based off the choice scenario and do another script and take our trip back to hollywood um would you like to be the parent or the the child uh tina i'll be the parent this time oh you're gonna be the parent okay all right whenever you are ready it's time to go to bed right now i don't want to go to bed why not? Because I want to play. Going to bed when you're having fun is hard. Yeah, yeah. What if we played one quiet game that I pick and then bed? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. What are we going to play? So if we play one quiet game, we go to bed after, uh, or we could go to bed now and play a loud game after school tomorrow at the park. What do you think? All right, good job. Round of applause for Tina one, once again. I'm telling you, I don't think I'm going to ever be able to get her on a, a, another live stream. She's going to be uh, hire an agent, and she's not going to participate in any of this stuff anymore. So, uh, All right, let me put the script back on the screen. Uh, again, go in the comments. Let me know uh, what you think is happening in, in this interaction. Tina, uh, like before, what are your initial thoughts on on this, this interaction as it relates oh. to choice and, and um, empowerment? Well, I think, uh, you know, stating what you want the child to do, but then also, you know, making it into a game, you know, as in here's a choice, here's choices, you know, um, a quiet game, then go to bed or tomorrow, and then we can have a loud game. And I think that is just playing into exactly what the child is wanting to do, which yep. is to play. And that's what a child's job is. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and that's a good point too, Tina. Is sometimes the response I'll get from parents when I like present stuff like this, I can't let my child dictate everything and just run the house, right? We're not in this. This is why I would the phrase as well, quiet game. You're still setting boundaries, expectations, and standards. You're not completely bending, but you're you're doing it in a way that it's a negotiation and it's almost like a win-win uh, for both for both parties. And then if we circle back to the top. Um, the child says right away, I don't want to go to bed. And, and based off of my conversations with parents, Tina, I don't know if you agree with this. This was a big one. The, the bedtime ritual can cause some, some issues. So right off the bat, um, the parents like, all right, it's time to go to bed. The child says, I don't want to. What do you, what does the parent do there in response that maybe helps reduce some defensiveness and anxiety you think? I think once again, validating that, you know, yeah, going to bed, it's hard when you're having fun. It's really hard to, to, you know, slow down and have to, you know, go into, I think this is where it's so important to have a bedtime routine with kids. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to, um, we're going to talk a little bit Good. more on how to, because the other thing is, and I believe we'll talk about this, um, is we don't want to have to negotiate uh, everything. Um, you want to avoid last minute negotiations if possible. Um, and we'll talk about some strategies to do that. But in this situation, we are where we are, right? And right off the bat, the parent, instead of jumping to conclusions, remember how we talked about initially, Tina, that um, being, uh, empowering someone means 
you believing you're the expert, but treating someone else like they are. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening right off the bat in this interaction, right? They're saying, I don't want to go to bed. The parent probably knows why. Well, it's probably because you want to watch more shows. Or it's probably because you want to have more fun. But instead of them jumping to, I know why, you're, you're right away empowering uh, the child to say, and you're saying, why not? Tell me. I want to know from your perspective why you don't want to go to bed instead of me jumping to conclusions. Because even if I'm right when I jump to a conclusion, it's going to create defensiveness and anxiety because I'm jumping to conclusions. And no one likes to have assumptions be made about how they think without having the chance to share how they think. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and then to your point, uh, the child says, because I want to play. And then they, again, we have the empathy, right? Going to bed when you're having fun is hard. It's not a question. It's not a uh, judgmental statement. It is simply a neutral statement that connects and empathizes with what the child is experiencing and then what they're feeling. And then you, you touched on what uh, the other items there were creating choice. A quiet game, go to bed after. Um, then if the child wanted a loud game, you notice put in there, or we do one of those big loud games after school tomorrow. So that's the thing they, they really work. If that's the thing they were really excited about, then maybe providing that choice, but with different expectations can get you there. And then at the end, what does the parent do again? The very last thing, Tina, at the very last line. What do you think? What do you think? Thinking drives behavior. Um, empowerment and choice comes from allowing someone to come to their conclusions based on how they think and they feel. Uh, we want to do that as much as possible with our children if we're looking for uh, long-term change. If you're looking for compliance, you just want what you want in that moment, then you're probably not going to give a lot of choices, I would imagine, right? Uh, and sometimes compliance is needed. But if you want change, then we're talking about providing those options and letting them choose. Uh, Mary in the comments. Hi, Mary. What's up? Mary is one of my favorites. She is always supporting. I speak for MC. She says, good choices. I love to give choices for empowerment. Uh, absolutely. I can vouch for, for you for doing that, Mary. You are amazing. And you are a rock star. All right, Tina, how'd that feel going to be in an Academy Award winning uh, actress there? I just, I want to thank the Academy. Yeah, I wanna, <laughs> she wants to thank the Academy. All right, let's real, before we move on to the next uh, acronym, Tina, let's just take a really quick moment to talk about incentives uh, versus bribes. Incentives versus bribes. What do you, what do you think initially is kind of, uh, the difference between an incentive and a bribe when we're talking about children? Ooh, incentive. It sounds like an incentive is more like I'm going to do something and I'm going to get rewarded for that, for my actions and for it. Where a bribe is like, uh, do I really want to do this? Uh, I'm kind of being forced. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well said. So the incentive is there is a reward um, that matters to that person who's receiving it on an intrinsic level. It's something that's important to them. So they are incentivized to work towards a behavior that they see value in because it connects with them intrinsically what that in in incentive is. Whereas a bribe is more comply. Uh, I want this behavior. I'll give you this stuff to do the behavior that I want you to do. Whereas an incentive is you are motivated to do the things that you are motivated to make your own choices because it will lead to an incentive that you want. Um, incentives are really, I think, important just across the board on what pop, no matter what population that you're serving. It's just that the main thing is making sure that the incentives connect with what the person values. If you're just saying, I'll give you 10 bucks if you do this. I remember when working with young people, they look at me and they'd be like, Man, I got 20 bucks in my pocket. I don't need your 10 bucks to do that, right? <laughs> that was not something that was of a, a value um, to them. Incentives teach that being uh, patient and choosing positive behaviors lead to rewards that are important to you. Um, bribes teach that poor behaviors can get you uh, really quick rewards. And if the behavior is not bad enough, maybe we need to ramp it up and get even worse to really get our, the reward we want. The example um, I always think, and I'm sure you've seen this, Tina, is like out in a store, out in public, child kicking their feet, I want a candy, I want candy, I want candy. You're not getting candy. And then the child's like, okay, let's ramp it up a bit. Ah, right. And then now the parent's looking around and they're like, oh, it's embarrassing. Just, just grab something, pick it then. What we did is we just taught the child, if you behave this way and you push it to a, to a certain level, you're eventually going to get what you want. And when we start teaching that, then we're essentially saying, 
hey, there, there, there are no boundaries to how far you can push things. So keep pushing them. I um, mean, it's a very, it's a very tough place to be as a parent. You, I see you make, you, you're making some faces. You, you have some thoughts on that, Tina? I'm like trying not to yeah. stuff, but I just have to say, there's a two-letter word, parents. It is totally okay to say it to your children. No. Mm. Bottom line, no. And I think that so often parents are don't tell their kids no as a child. And guess why I had to open two schools for kids that have never been told no. Yeah. And, and I will I will say to that, too, and it goes back to our foundation, I think how you say no matters. If it's just no, you're not getting it, that can say, okay, well, let's get into this power struggle then, is what the child is saying. Let's get into this power struggle, and let's see how, uh, how strong that no of yours is, right? As opposed to... You know, not not right now, sweetie. You know, we, we talked about earlier that we weren't going to get candy today because we have a plan later. Well, I really want I really want some. I get you. I want to eat a bunch of candy, too, as we discussed, you know, and then you're, you're constantly trying to connect your voice is down because you're not trying to increase the anxiety and the defensiveness. Uh, and then what I always suggest, and it's not a part of this training, is once they are, they're no longer emotionally heightened revisit that conversation mm -hmm. you know hey sweetie let me let's talk about earlier what happened at the store you you have that conversation now in a place where they could be more open-minded so that then the behavior doesn't repeat itself i think also preparing so i i love to parent proactively and so before an event before the grocery store visit before you know whatever it is that situation that my child and I are going into, I like to have that conversation in the car beforehand. Like, for example, uh, we're going to the grocery store. We haven't had our dinner yet. So how about we buy a dessert and then we can have that after we come home and have dinner, you know, or to have a conversation and just be proactive in your parenting uh, is really important and it helps a lot of the arguments. In yeah. That's a really good point, Tina. And, and it really, yeah, it's, it's, it's really about investing on the front end, uh, putting more effort in on the front end. So then you're avoiding some of these things on, on, on the back end, if at all possible. But sometimes you find yourself in the dreaded A of Cape. And we're going to spend our last <laughs> 10 minutes here or so talking about the dreaded A. Uh, Tina, Tina, have you ever gotten to an argument with a child before? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's not go into specifics on that one. Let's talk about the A. Uh, the A stands for avoid arguments. All right, so now we're going to run through a couple of scripts. Tina, you ready for this? Let's let's look at some uh, some scenarios here. Do you want to be the child or the parent? I'll be the parent again. All right, ready, action. It's time to go to bed right now. I don't want to go to bed. Well, it's bedtime but I don't want to go to bed. Well, you are. No, I'm not. All right, action. <laughs> what's uh, what's <laughs> happening in that scenario, uh, Tina? What's... Oh, power struggle, power struggle. Yeah, we're just saying, let's go, let's get after it. And uh, by the way, for power struggles with parents, there is no winner. No one, no one wins a power struggle with a child because if you make the child do something, all they're do, they're gonna feel resentful they're going to feel angry and frustrated. And someone who is, especially a child, someone who is normally uh, frustrated and resentful, what they want is to get that person back who made them feel that way. So even if you force them, um, they're going to be looking for their opportunity to get a win. The other problem with a power struggle is let's say you enter it, but then you let them win, like the grocery store example. Now that tells them, oh, I can win these. So then when the next one comes, I'm going to keep fighting till I, I win. Right. So let's 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 look at another one here. Tina, uh, this is good old Halloween candy. Uh, you want to be the parent on this one or the child? Oh, I'll be the child. OK. All right. Action. No more Halloween candy tonight. Tina, <laughs> I want one more. If you have one more, you're going to get sick, Tina. Oh, no, I won't. Yes, you will. But I won't. Look, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not arguing with you. <laughs> so when <laughs> The irony of both those, right? I'm not arguing with you today. Well, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. Oh, man, now, now you're just stuck, right? You're like, wait, wait, what, what, what's everybody doing? Uh, what's, obviously, what, what's going on here, Tina? What are your initial impressions on this one? Well, 
Well, first and foremost, like I told Curtis, if anyone took away my candy, yeah. <laughs> they're going to be catching these hands. Uh <laughs> Tina wanted to enter a power struggle for me even creating a fake scenario where you take candy. This is this is a, <laughs> this was right. one of Tina's triggers. Apparently, oh, so. yes. Yeah. yeah. But but obviously, look, we're going back and forth. We're, we're, we're saying we're not arguing, but we are. And now we're just in this power struggle again. Let's um, I believe uh, I believe I got one more here. Let's yeah, let's do this last one. All right. Action. Am I the parent? Uh, I'll be the parent <laughs> this time. Uh, why did you throw that at him? I didn't. You did. I saw you do it. He threw it at me first. Well, what would you do for, for him to throw it at you? Nothing. You need to go say sorry. I'm not. Mm. Uh, thoughts on this one, Tina? What's what's happening with the, with this interaction here? So I remember learning about uh, when my, what, you know, learning about children that lie. Mm. And so, you know, this was a situation where uh, the child is lying because you actually saw this. But I'll never forget the first time my son lied when he was a little guy. And and then I looked at him and I said, I feel so sorry. I said, I feel so sad that you don't trust the world enough to be honest. Mm. And I tell you what, my child, he cried and cried. And mm. he was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then he was honest. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, I think, showing that empathy and or, you know, showing that Maybe you were frustrated, and, and yeah. sometimes when we're frustrated, we do things that you know hurt others and um, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and the other thing, that's a good point too. The other thing that's happening here from the parents' perspective, and again, um, I want to restate the empowerment piece, is even though you are the expert, and even in this situation, the parents saw what happened, so they are an expert in what they saw. But can you suspend that to treat the child like they're an expert in that situation as well? Because the quickest way to create defensiveness, anxiety, and a power struggle is to label or shame someone. If someone feels they're being labeled, shamed for what they did or how they think, that is going to create defensiveness right away, even if you're correct. So again, what we want to do here is take a step back, find out from the child's perspective what, what happened, uh, talk through it. If if the goal if the goal is is changed. So we talked about some examples of uh, arguments, and then we also talked about uh, the power struggle piece. Again, if you enter a power struggle, even if you force the child to comply, they're going to be ready for another fight soon, so they can get a win. If the child wins, then they're going to be ready for another fight soon because they already won and they want another one. Um, so we want to do our best to avoid power struggles unless you're looking for compliance. If you're looking for an immediate compliance, you know, go do your, your power struggle thing. Uh, but if you're looking for change, we really want to avoid uh, those. And then one of my favorite quotes from Jay-Z, Tina, was, if you argue with a fool from a distance, you can't tell who is who. Mm. And the thing is, is if you're arguing with a child from a distance, it looks like two children arguing. Um, so you got to keep, keep, keep that uh, as mine as well and be a part of the solution, not not contributing to the defensiveness and the anxiety. And then here, here's what I wanted to touch on because you mentioned it a couple times, uh, Tina. It's called setting the stage. And this is what you were talking about is about explaining expectations in advance so that when the situation comes up, it's not this uh, surprise. So when you set the stage, as Tina talked about in advance saying, hey, here's where we're going. This is what's going to happen when we go. When we leave, this is what uh, the next step is. By setting the stage, it aligns expectations with reality. That's another big thing that can cause defensiveness and anxiety is if my expectations for a situation did not align with what the reality of the situation was. That can create defensiveness for sure. Uh, setting the stage also reduces anxiety, makes a child feel comfortable and secure, and it can also put the parents at ease, right? It gives you a little bit of, all right, we're all on the same page going into this thing. It can reduce a little bit of stress um, for the parent as well. So that is uh, setting the stage and that'll help you avoid any of those last minute negotiations. Any other thoughts on the kind of the setting the stage piece, uh, Tina? I think the, the key is communication. Yeah. Yeah. On the front end uh, and in advance, putting your effort. And, and I get it. Sometimes parents are like, I, I don't, I worked a full day. I got all <laughs> of this going on. I don't have time to explain every little thing to you. I, I, I empathize with that for sure. Anytime someone makes a statement 
like that. The only thing I challenge them to do is then align your expectations with the reality of that statement. Don't say I don't have the time to do that on the front end and then get frustrated when things blow up in that situation, right? Because you you did not do the thing, the soil, the water, and the sunshine that committed to the growth that, that you wanted, right? So, but if you say I don't have the time and you be like, it is what it is, whatever happens, well, at least you're aligning your expectations with reality, I suppose. Uh, but it is about uh, putting that effort on, on the, the, the front end. All right, let's just look at one before we wrap up because I have 101 on the on the time, Tina. Let's just show them one situation that could have resulted in an argument, but we we switched up our approach a little bit. You go with that? Yes. All right. Which one? Uh, the as we discuss, it's time to go to bed. The okay. bed one. All right. You want to be parent or child for this last? I'll be one? the child. All right. Ready? Action. As we discussed, it is time to go to bed. I don't want to go to bed. Uh, why not? Because I want to play. Going to bed when you're having fun, uh, it, it can be hard. Yep. Uh, what if we played one quiet game that I pick and then bed? Yes. Okay, so we play one quiet quiet game, uh, then go to bed, or we just go to bed at the time we discussed, and then tomorrow do one of those loud, exciting games at the park. Uh, what do you think? Yes. And scene. So again, and, and we did a variation of this one uh, earlier, but instead of saying, I'm the expert, you need to do what I told you to do, or open up the opportunity for choice, for empowerment, and creating that defense, reducing that defensiveness and that anxiety. All right. Let's go. Here's the other two uh, elements of Kate. Uh, the P is practicing patience. With it being 102 and you being so patient with me, uh, we don't have time to go into the practicing uh, patience part. Um, but I will encourage you, if you go to speakformc.com in the blog section, I did write an entire blog on practicing uh, patience, not only with children, but uh, with your coworkers, with your partner, just, just in general, uh, practicing that patience. So go ahead and check out that blog. And then the other part um, of Kate, obviously, is expressing uh, empathy. I have an entire uh, playlist on YouTube dedicated to empathy. Is I believe in it uh, so much. And then also there's a bunch of blogs and resources that you can learn more about the role uh, empathetic interactions uh, inter have with children. Oh my goodness, Tina, we did it. Yay! Oh, I can't believe we made it. I'm three minutes over, but we did not have any technology issues. Uh, Tina, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. It was a pleasure to be able to bounce ideas uh, off of you. Do you have any um, a I, final thoughts? I have or? one final thought please, that please. I wanted to share with parents is you touched upon it a little bit of how busy we are and everything. And I just want to share with you parents to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, you are priority and your life matters and you matter. So uh, please take care of yourself. Yeah. I, well, well said, and, and I don't want to keep just plugging the book, but there is uh, a couple chapters specifically where you're talking about with self-care. If, if your cup uh, is overflowing, you can't pour more in, so you have to be able to empty uh, some, of, some of the stuff that's weighing you down from time to time so that you can pour more in. So that's a really good, good point because it is hard from time to time. Life is overwhelming. There's so much going on, um, so definitely practicing self-care. And then, Tina, is there any other, um, I don't know if there's any social you wanted to share, if you wanted to direct them to any? Sure, yeah, Tina Talks Truth on all socials and uh, my website, tinatalkstruth.com. Awesome, awesome. And Tina really um, is doing some incredible work in the community uh, for Pinellas and Pasco, uh, and to see to see young people overcome uh, the type of adversity that they have is inspiring because if, when they do that, they're giving themselves tools that are going to be so useful as adults and to be able to come what, what life has. So congratulations to you and all the awesome work you. uh, you're doing, Tina. Do not forget for me, speakformc.com. Uh, go to the website, check out the blogs, uh, but mainly subscribe to the channel. Uh, we are going to decide how many of these we are going to do based off of the response we get. And if you did participate with us today, I thank you so much. Um, this was a big thing for us. We've, we've never done it before. We've never tried it. You never know how stuff like this is going to go. Um, but to have you be a part of uh, making history with Speak for MC, it means a lot. Um, there's a lot of negativity in the world. So for you to be here with me and participate 
in the, in the solution and, and, and contribute uh, positivity to, to those around us, that's a big deal. And there is more positive than negative out there. I know that for a fact. So if someone tells you there's more negative, no, 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 they're just negative themselves. So uh, let's, con let's, let's uh, contribute to positive uh, change and hope. Shout out to Hope Cross, our moderator. Again, uh, she put her website and her information in the chat. If you want to be inspired, motivated, training, development, all that good stuff, she is what her name is. She is Hope. So you will not go uh, wrong with that. Let me look at the, before we end, Tina, let me look at the chat. Any final comments, uh, questions in here? Uh, Ven said, thank you much, so much, Tina and Curtis. Yes, Ven, thank you for... Uh, attending. You, you attend a lot of uh, the Speak From C stuff, so I appreciate your support. Amato, thank you for contributing so much in the chat as well. I loved your answers and your responses. Mary, you're amazing. Um, and everyone else who is watching after the training is over, thank you. And hit that subscribe button, and we got some more coming up. Go to the website, check it out. Peace. Tina, throw it to peace. Peace. Hit that like. <laughs> All right. Hit hit that. Yeah. Hit the like. Oh, thank you, Tina. That's how you know I don't know what I'm what I'm doing. Hit the like, comment, subscribe, share, all of that good stuff. All right, people. I'm hitting the end stream button before I keep going. Bye. <laughs>